Hey everyone, happy Thursday. Uh, I'm going to be posting this lecture. It's on chapters 15 and 16. Uh, please make sure to listen to the lecture. I'm going to try to keep it as short as possible um, and answer the questions that follow. So last we spoke, Holden had that horrible encounter with Sonny and we discussed a lot um, whether or not prostitution should be legalized. We discussed the irony of Sonny's name. We discussed also uh, how Sonny represents really this very tragic young figure who's had her innocence and childhood kind of taken away in many ways, either by circumstance or the life decisions that she's made. In chapter 15 opens up and Holden says, I didn't sleep too long because I think it was only around 10 o'clock when I woke up. I felt pretty hungry as soon as I had a cigarette. The last time I'd eaten was those two hamburgers I had with Brossard and Ackley when we went to Agerstown to the movies. So Holden is going to see, you're going to see that as the novel progresses, he's going to be smoking a lot more. He's not going to have a big appetite. I mean, he's not gonna, he hasn't really eaten well. You know, in the beginning of the year, when we discussed symbolism, uh, we discussed how some symbols are timeless and universal. They generally tend to mean the same thing across cultures and literature across the world. Symbols like light, uh, symbols like fire, water, uh, food, which is so central to the human experience, obviously. The sustenance that we need in order to stay alive is always very, very symbolic. Um, the act of cooking for someone is usually symbolic of love, of wanting to nurture someone. And look at Holden. He very much lacks this. He's been eating either very minimally or very poorly. And it really goes to show that he's lacking uh, this like nutrition, not just maybe of the body, but maybe mentally, maybe emotionally. Once again, I'll bring your attention, as we have all throughout the novel, to Holden's mental state, which tends to be very lonely, very depressed. He repeats the word crazy often. And the lack of food, I think, symbolizes this also. Continuing our discussion of symbols in chapter 15, you'll see that Holden, once again, uh, not Penn Station this time, but Grand Central Station. Um, he, Holden has a moment there. And once again, this kind of continues this, these symbols of transience, uh, which are really indicative of Holden's state. Transients being things that are not permanent, that are temporary, that are in a state of constant change, a flux, right? And Holden in many ways uh, represents this kind of person that doesn't have a permanent, stable place in his life. Yes, he's frozen. He has an unwillingness to move forward and become an adult, which we'll discuss later on this lecture. That's called the Peter Pan complex. Um, but it's also the notion that, you know, he's he doesn't have a home. He doesn't have a stable place. This is a boy who feels very lost. He's in limbo in many ways. While he's at Grand Central Station, though, he says, My father's quite wealthy, though. I don't know how much he makes. He's never discussed that stuff with me. But I imagine quite a lot. He's a corporation lawyer. Those boys really haul it in. Another reason I know he's quite well off, he's always investing money in shows on Broadway. They always flop, though. And it drives my mother crazy when he does it. She hasn't felt too healthy since my brother Ali died. She's very nervous. Now, once again, Holden seems to have this kind of um, interesting relationship with mom and dad. Specifically his father. If you'll notice, he hasn't spoken quite well of him throughout the novel. Uh, nothing very damning or very kind of accusatory. But definitely you get the sensation that Holden's relationship with his father is very rocky. Uh, once again, I'm probably mirroring Salinger's own relationship with his father. Uh, remember that the book is dedicated to my mother. Um, Holden says something here very interesting. He says that his mother's a very nervous kind of person. Uh, he's going to bring this up later on uh, towards the end of Catcher in the Rye. And, you know, again, this is a novel uh, that's a testimony by a s soldier uh, talking about how his experience has really damaged his view of society. It's a novel about a young boy who's looking at the adult world and doesn't like the values, the system in place, and ultimately utterly rejects it in many ways, right? But it's also a novel about mental health in many ways. And one thing about mental health is it is hereditary, a lot of it. Uh, if parents tend to suffer from depression or schizophrenia or anxiety, it can be something that they pass along to their kids. Now, you and I in today's modern generation are very well versed about this. But in the 1950s, mental health wasn't something that people readily talked about. It was things that were kind of like swept under the rug and 
people didn't really want to confront it because it was just seen as a, you know, to have somebody in your family that maybe suffered or you yourself from some sort of mental strain, instability or mental health issues was seen as something shameful, uh, something you kind of swept under the rug and didn't really deal with, much less in public. So, you know, kudos to Salinger or props to him for not only creating this novel that contested censorship rights and values uh, of the country that really brought to light a lot of things that were hypocritical and wrong with American society, but also for bringing attention to mental health issues and how um, sometimes people going through mental trauma uh, suffer a lot in a very personal, very kind of uh, unique way, the way Holden is. Chapter 15, though, really focuses on two characters, two negative experiences that Holden's had, one of them with Dick Slagle and the other one with a boy named Louis Shaney. You're going to start to see that as the second half of the novel unfolds, it really becomes a novel about all the things that are wrong with the adult world and all the things that we have to change from our beliefs when we were kids and how we, the world, especially the adult world, forces us to readjust our values in many ways and um, kind of acquiesce or conform or follow or go along with these kind of adult rules that are in place. And Holden, you know, uh, you can very much tell he romanticizes his childhood when he was a kid uh, and that he's had a lot of negative experiences. I mean, we can start from chapter one and you can pretty much tell that Holden's had a lot of very negative encounters with a lot of people that have shown him a lot of very negative things about the adult world and what it means to be uh, grown up, all right? Through the character of Dick Slagle, who's a boy who's very obviously insecure around Holden because of his wealth. Remember always that Holden's uh, pretty wealthy. His father's a corporation lawyer. Those guys make a lot of money. Uh, corporation lawyers defend big companies like Coca-Cola and Apple. Uh, and they're oftentimes not really... Um, viewed as being the most moral of lawyers. lawyers. They practice law not to defend the people, but to defend companies against lawsuits and things like that. And they make a lot of money. Um, but look at Dick Slagle, this boy that Holden has a very kind of negative encounter with while at one of his older schools. I think it was Elkton Hills. Um, and look what Holden learns through that, right? If you read the chapter, you know very well that there's a kind of friction there because Dick Slagle is jealous of Holden's better suitcases. You know, suitcases, ironically, they're kind of funny, but in the old days, they were considered a sign of how much wealth you had. You know, if poor people didn't have expensive suitcases. Uh, wealthy people didn't have less expensive suitcases. Uh, and look what Holden learns through this encounter, that adults care about your income, your finance, how much money you make. Uh, whereas, you know, when we're kids, does money really matter? I mean, think about it for a second. When you're a child, do you really fully grasp um, the value of money? How much it costs uh, to buy a pair of jeans that you want or how much an annual salary is. Money is something and materialism that as a child you, you really aren't concerned with. And you know, uh, probably Holden would say that you're better off because of that. When you're a child, um, I remember my daughter at one point um, finding a quarter in the street. Uh, I think she was four or five. And she came running to us, Papa, look, I'm rich, I'm rich. Uh, and it made me laugh in a kind of very uh, endearing way because, you know, you start to realize that kids find something shiny and metal and they think, oh, I'm going to buy a, she said she was going to buy a helicopter with the quarter. And it kind of made me laugh at her innocence and how pure she was in the sense that, you know, she thinks that a quarter can buy a helicopter. And think about like how you get older, how money plays a huge role in your life. Uh, specifically, you know, the quest for money, the getting an education, the wanting to go to college, the wanting to purchase material things that maybe are beyond your financial limit in some ways. And it's sad, but one of the major focuses of adult life is the accruing, the getting of money, the being smart with money, the saving money, the spending money wisely. It seems that money seems to be this kind of huge focus. And... You're going to see that as Holden, this, or the novel unfolds in the second half, that uh, Holden's going to have a lot of encounters with children, and he's going to reminisce about how pure and how innocent and how simple and how beautiful life was there, devoid of things like money, like boys like Luke, Dick Slagle, who care about how much money you have. 
And then on the other hand, there's the boy Louis Shaney, who suddenly gets very kind of cold and distant with Holden when he realizes, or he asks him in a kind of uh, hidden way, in an, uh, what Holden's religion is. And that's another thing I think that as we get older, we kind of um, learn about the adult world, that there are things that divide us, things that separate us, right? Not just, and not things that should separate us, but that society dictates should separate us. One of them is obviously materialism and money, like we just discussed. But look at Lewis Shaney. It's the notion of religion. You know, I'm, uh, and again, I, we've spoken a lot about religion because it's something that shows up in world literature. An English class would not be uh, complete, I think, without uh, even a superficial discussion of the role religion has played in world literature in our lives, right? Um, but the thing is, with religion is, is, you know, one of the things that we have brought up in class, and again, this is not to dissuade you or persuade you to be any more or any less religious. I want to just make that clear, as I always have in class. Um, but there's so many world religions out there, and it is a source of division in many ways. Oh, you're Jewish, I'm Christian. Oh, you're Muslim, no, I'm Buddhist. Oh, you can't marry that kind of people. Or you can't mix those cultures. Or, yeah, you can have friends that are different religions. But when it comes time to marry, I want you to marry within the religion. Uh, and what Holden starts to see is that these things are incredibly divisive. You know, when you're a child, you don't you go to the playground. You don't care what, what color people's skin are or how much money their parents make. Or whether or not they're Baptist or Protestant or Jewish or Orthodox Jewish or Shiite or Sunni. You just want to play. You know, little children have this wonderful, innocent quality of really just embracing most people, right? They don't see skin color. They don't see religion. They don't see material wealth. And that's one of the things I think that Holden is starting to realize that as we get older, we lose, right? That, in, that ability to just, not that we lose the ability to be more welcoming, but that society places upon us these restrictions, these divisions, these separations in many ways that fall along the lines of money, faith, education, social status, right? Something that I think we're very free of when we're children. Through the character of Sally Hayes's mother, uh, Holden uh, and Salinger really attack another aspect of society that I think is pretty dark, and that's the, the notion of charity. You know, charity or charitable works are when you uh, work at a soup kitchen or you donate money or you do something for the greater good, right? Uh, there's a great vocabulary word for this. It's called altruism, A-L-T-R-U-I-S-M. I will be posting it up. Uh, altruism is the act of wanting to help others, of doing good for um, someone other than yourself. And look what Holden recognizes that sometimes charity isn't really charity, right? That people donate um, but then they spend the rest of the day telling other people that they've donated, right? Um, for example, one of the greatest things that I think that our school does, which is good for other people, is we do this blood drive. And blood drive is, is a great thing. You know, it helps out a lot of people. But a lot of people flaunt that button after the blood drive. You know, you kind of get this button or this ribbon and you kind of walk around the school like, oh, look at me, I, I donated blood. And look what Holden's starting to realize. Again, he does have a dark view of society, but... He is, Salinger's kind of right in this respect, you know, that the true act of charity is when you give and you don't say anything about it, right? That giving to charity and then telling people that you gave to charity isn't really charity, right? Because if you donate 20 bucks to a specific charity and then you spend the remainder of the week telling everybody that you're a good person because you donated $20, then those $20 really haven't gone towards the charity of your choice, where they've really gone is towards improving your own reputation, right? So look what Holden is saying. Once again, that phoniness, right? Um, that you give, but it's not for the act of giving. It's more for the act of promoting your ego, your own self in some ways. Uh, I don't know if you guys probably know him, but there's a very famous singer from the 1980s. His name uh, was George Michael, a British singer, sang a very famous song called Faith. You might want to look it up. Um... George Michael was very famous in the 80s, and he passed away, I'm not quite sure, but maybe not too long ago, I want to say maybe like five years ago now, and obviously he made a lot of money in the 1980s from singing these very popular songs, 
And it turns out that after he died, for years, people were coming forward about how much money George Michael had donated either to a hospital, to a cancer patient, to a relief fund, but that he had donated all that money while he was alive under one condition, anonymous, that no one know that it was him, right? Uh, and only did the story start surfacing about how charitable he had been after he had died. Now, what would Holden say about that? That's real charity, right? That's the act of selfless giving without any sense of self-promotion, right? Um, you know, Holden's starting to realize that a lot of the, a lot of the adult world is is all about. It's very selfish in many ways, right? Uh, my money, my religion, my reputation in some ways. And he rejects it completely. One of the things that Holden also brings up uh, in these two chapters is his encounter with the nuns. It kind of makes a lot of sense why he enjoys their company. Holden is a boy who's hung up on preserving childhood innocence. You know, he's a boy who looks back at his life before he encountered trauma and horrible things, before Ali died, before... Uh, failing school, before knowing the importance of money, before being let down by so many people, was a time in his life like you and I. I mean, I did ask you guys to write a one-page reflection once about um, the things we missed from childhood. And let's face it, childhood was a very kind of innocent, carefree time in our lives. Uh, not to use a cliche, but you really don't know what you have or you've had until you've lost it. And I think children live in many ways in this state of bliss and innocence because uh, they're unaware of the responsibilities and the things that await them when they are on the cusp of childhood and they do decide to come of age. And I think Holden likes the nuns because they represent adults that try in some way to hold on to their innocence, right? Nuns live lives that are devoted selflessly or should be devoted selflessly just for others. They devote their lives. They uh, take vows of chastity, which means they're pure in the physical sense, they refrain or they don't have any sex. And I think Holden enjoys the nuns because they represent adulthoods that are, or I'm sorry, adults that are child, children in some ways, right? That they, they're adults who try very hard to preserve their innocence. Interestingly enough, and again, I can't say this enough about my respect for Salinger as a writer. He really is a literary genius. I mean, the I'm not, I'm, I say this quite often to my students, but some of you might go back one day and reread these novels that we've read in class or that you've read in high school with other teachers as adults, and you'll start to see things that maybe your life experience uh, now allows you to look at literature through another lens. And, you know, I've read and reread The Catcher in the Rye so many times, and every time I read it, I find something new. It's a phenomenal novel in that regard. And look at Salinger, a lot of the, he brings up a lot of literary illusions. He decides to talk a lot to the nuns about literature. And there's one thing that all the literature has in common and that they're all tragedies. Now, after Catcher in the Rye, we'll be reading either remote learning or in school, we'll be reading a tragedy called Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare. And you'll know that a tragedy is a play or a work of literature in which a protagonist dies. And you're going to see, unfortunately, throughout the later half of the novel, Holden's going to mention a lot of suicide and self-harm. Uh, look at the uh, date with Sally Hayes, which we'll discuss a lot more tomorrow. Uh, but he burns those matches and he waits till the fire gets to his fingers and burns them. That's just the first sign that Holden's thoughts are going to be becoming increasingly suicidal. And remember that we are watching this young boy deteriorate. Uh, towards this breakdown, which is what lands him in that mental rest home that he's in as he's telling us this narrative of all these things that have happened to him. Um, but look at the literary illusion that Salinger uses. Uh, he doesn't relent. He's a genius writer in that regard. Uh, it seems like this is a novel about uh, a boy ranting and raving, stream of consciousness. The conversation goes everywhere off on tangents. But the truth is it's very well constructed. And even the illusions there are all there for a reason. And all the illusions, all the literature that shakes, that he talks to the nuns about, Romeo and Juliet, Othello, Hamlet, happen to all be tragedies, right? Uh, probably reflecting Holden's own increasing suicidal thoughts. One of the things that he spends a lot of time talking about are Hamlet, is Hamlet, the play Hamlet, at, which we discussed at length uh, throughout class. It's the basis for The Lion King. Um, and when you guys get to senior year, every one of you will read it. Unless, of course, there's like a COVID-21 or a COVID-22. Ha ha, 
That's a joke. Just kidding. Um, and every tragic uh, protagonist in a tragedy has a problem. It's called a tragic flaw. Something that's wrong with them. And Hamlet, which Holden seems to be obsessed about, Hamlet's tragic flaw is a very unique one. It's it's the flaw, you know, other Shakespearean protagonists that are also tragic heroes have different flaws. Some of them are too greedy, too ambitious, too jealous, right? But Hamlet's tragic flaw is a unique one. Hamlet's tragic flaw is inaction, right? It's this thing that he has this, he knows what he needs to do, he just refuses to do it. Look at the famous lines in Hamlet. To be or not to be. Hamlet's all about existence, about action, about being alive, taking a part in the world, right? Uh, conforming in many ways to what life and destiny has planned out for us. And it's very, very ironic, very, very well written in the illusion sense that uh, Salinger writes about Holden's fascination with Hamlet because that is Holden's problem in many ways. His inaction his frozen in time, his inability to want to do schoolwork, to assume responsibilities, right? And yet, once again, one of the bigger pieces of this beautiful literary puzzle that Salinger has created. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce something that's really, really important because it is will pertain to your essay, which I'm going to figure out how we're going to be doing this. But over the course of the next couple of weeks, um, we're going to be finishing up The Catcher in the Rye. We're going to have a mock trial. Um, and you will be writing an essay. Don't worry, guys. I know you guys have a lot of work on your plate. I know that remote learning isn't ideal. I know that some of you feel maybe like you're swamped with work, but I'm going to be lenient with you guys. I'm going to try to make the work as interesting and as light as possible. Okay, so chapter 16 is a good opportunity for us to introduce uh, what Holden's second major complex is, and that's something called the Peter Pan complex. Keep in mind that your essay question is going to ask you to identify with three of Holden's complexes are, the first one being the protector complex, which Holden gets from the death of Ali. This one is the Peter Pan complex, okay? Um, and Hol uh, Salinger really sets it up through the use of symbolism yet again throughout this chapter. So what do you think a Peter Pan complex is? Well, a Peter Pan complex is this desire or this lack of desire, better said, uh, of wanting to grow up. It's very obviously a literary illusion to a novel which was written, believe it or not, all the way in 1902 uh, by an author named J.M. Barry, who created this character which has become since very famous called Peter Pan. Now, please always remember what we talked about, that oftentimes children's tales tend to be what's called, I like to call Disney-fied. Walt Disney Company likes to come in and kind of reimagine these tales. And because Disney makes all these great films and it's such a multi-million dollar industry that we kind of remember the Disney version, but we forget the original version, right? Um, Peter Pan was a young boy, uh, according to the original novel, that had a beautiful smile. He still had all his first teeth. He was very, very young, uh, probably around the ages of four or five. And he represented this kind of boy who lived in this um, never, never land where people never grew, uh, where everyone maintained that innocence of youth. You didn't age physically. You also didn't mature emotionally. All right. Um, is in his original appearance, believe it or not, uh, Peter Pan's only about I think like uh, very very young. So he really represents in many ways like the the ideal innocence of kids who have no idea the way society or the world works. Um, now a Peter Pan complex is a condition. It interestingly enough, it usually involves males in which a person refuses to accept the adult world and instead relies on the behavior and reality of a much younger self. Um, Peter Pan complex, according to psychologists, is much more common among boys, uh, young ladies, as we've discussed in class, uh, because of their physical changes, as well as because of the societal pressures, tend to mature a lot quicker than boys. Girls uh, develop and accelerate mentally at a much faster rate, they read and write faster um, as children over boys, uh, statistically. Um, they learn to walk faster oftentimes. And young girls traditionally have always been thrusted with like responsibilities of the house and sewing and cooking and cleaning, caring for the males in the family. And because of this, girls tend to mature a lot uh, sooner. Uh, also, the physical changes, the, the monthly reminder 
that you are a woman now. Whereas boys, we live in a society, I think, where boys are allowed to uh, mature slower. Uh, you know, there's that stupid saying, boys will be boys. Um, and boys are given much more the opportunity to kind of reject responsibility until later on in life, 18, 19, 20. Years when, by that time, really, a girl is expected to have matured into a young woman, right? So a Peter Pan compass, interestingly enough, is much more common among males. Um... The word, there's a Latin term, puer aeternus, which means eternal boy. It's used in mythology to designate, designate a child god who is forever young, right? Um, the, the boy in this kind of Latin mythology typically leads a very simple life, uh, separated from society, uh, due to the fear of being caught in an adult world. I mean, look at the word Peter Pan, the last word, Pan, is a god in Greco-Roman mythology. He's kind of like this childish um, forest god that is very mischievous in many ways. Uh, Pan in Greek mythology and Greco-Roman, the Romans also, very much wants independence, freedom. He hates boundaries. He hates limits uh, and, can't, and finds any restriction intolerable. He just can't deal with it. And how fitting is that for our protagonist, Holden? who very much uh, suffers from the same thing. Uh, so a Peter Pan complex would be the kind of like this inability to want to mature, to want to grow up. And Holden very much suffers from it. The truth is we all do at times. Remember that when we discuss psychological complexes, that complexes are common in all of us, that we've kind of uh, accrued or gotten these or developed these complexes from our past experiences, usually as young children, that affect the way we kind of view the world. And a lot of you express this. I mean, I think all of us in many ways suffer from the Peter Pan complex, this desire to kind of want to remain a child and refuse the responsibilities of the world. And it's something that Holden is very much um, suffering from in some ways. Uh, the motif of Frozen is in many ways this notion uh, that helps to develop the Peter Pan complex. But then Holden also uses, or I'm sorry, Salinger also uses wonderful symbols and these are symbols that I want you guys to write about in your essay, okay? The first one would be the symbol of... He decides to buy his younger kid sister, Phoebe, this record, okay? And this record is going to become a very important symbol. It's a record of a young girl singing about having lost her front teeth and how she's embarrassed about going out into public. Um, you know, along the many lines of growing up, think about how instrumental or think about how important losing your teeth are, specifically your front teeth. You know, when we're kids, we have these little chiclet teeth. They make our face look small. They make our face look cute. They're usually, uh, baby teeth, or oftentimes they're called milk teeth, are usually very, very white. They're very small. They make your face look cute and cuddly, right? And then all of a sudden, you go through this awkward phase where especially your front two teeth fall out. And all of a sudden, there's like these big gaps in your teeth. You start to look a little bit awkward. And then the teeth that come in change the entire dynamic of your face, right? All of a sudden, you're not that cute little kid anymore. Now you're kind of like, yeah, they're cute and little, but they're starting to change into something older, right? So it's very ironic, I think very fitting that Salinger includes this record. This record becomes a symbol within The Catcher in the Rye. Now, it's going to develop later on in some later chapters, so I'll be bringing it up again. But keep in mind that Holden's obsessed with this record because it's about a young girl who's lost her front teeth. Okay, um, And what he notices about the record is that it's a young girl who's singing it in a very mature way. right? So you're going to see this often now in the second half of Catcher in the Rye. Uh, the s things that are kind of caught between adulthood and childhood. And Phoebe's record represents this. You have this kind of young kid who's writing about a very childish experience, losing your front teeth. But she's, talk she's singing about it in a very sultry kind of adult way. And that's what catches... Holden's attention. Remember the record. We'll be speaking about it again uh, later on next week. And then while he's um, walking in the street, look what Holden says. It wasn't as cold as the day before, but the sun still wasn't out. And it wasn't too nice for walking, but there was one nice thing. Now, please always remember that when Holden says something that's nice or he feels good about it, this is not the normal. This is the anomaly in Holden. Remember that an, an anomaly is when something's different from the norm. And Holden's a boy who's very lonely and depressed. So when he says he likes things a lot, please pay close attention. It's usually something very important. 
um, this family that you could tell just came out of some church were walking right in front of me, a father, a mother, and a little kid about six years old. They looked sort of poor. The father had on one of these pearl gray hats that poor guys wear a lot when they want to look sharp. He and his wife were just walking along, talking, not paying any attention to their kid. The kid was swell. He was walking in the street instead of on the sidewalk, but right next to the curb. He was making out like he was walking a very straight line, the way kids do, and the whole time he kept singing and humming. I got up closer so I could hear what he was singing. He was singing that song, If a Body Catch a Body, Coming Through the Rye. He had a pretty little voice, too. He was just singing for the hell of it, you could tell. The car zoomed by, brakes screeched all over the place. His parents paid no attention to him, and they kept on walking next to the curb, singing, If a Body Catch a Body, Coming Through the Rye. It made me feel better. It made me feel not so depressed anymore. Now, obviously, this is a huge moment in the novel because we finally have a mention or a little bit of a clue insight as to what the title means, The Catcher in the Rye, uh, which we'll discuss at length. But look at the first mention here. You have a young boy. You know, Holden's mentioned crossing the street a lot. That's something that we haven't really discussed in class. Uh, early on, he says he feels like he's crossing the street and he's disappearing. Uh, maybe it represents kind of like this disconnect with society and the world and the feeling of loneliness. But look at this young boy. He's like... Teetering on the curb, right? He's like balancing. Think about how when you grow up also, what a big deal it is to finally be able to cross the street on your own, right? The street very much represents adulthood, the dangers of life, zooming cars, speeding. Um, and the little boy's balancing between these, this kind of like the dangers of adulthood represented by these cars and then his parents on one side. Right? And isn't that what life and growing up is about, right? You're, you're, the nurturing on one side of your parents, all the advice, the care they give you to prepare you really for the dangers, the cars, the zooming, uh, the speeding of the adult world. And look at this little boy. He's kind of like balancing in between them, you know? On a psychological level, this is also very well done by Salinger. He's six. Remember what happens when you're six, right? According to Freud, it's the awakening of the ego of the conscious, when young children finally become aware of reality, of life, right, about their place in the world. And um, look at this young boy, he's kind of teetering in between the safety of the curb, of the, of the sidewalk, his parents, and then the oncoming traffic, all the dangers of adult life and responsibility. And ironically enough, look what Holden realizes, that the parents are not really paying much attention to this kid. I mean, um, maybe that represents also maybe Holden... Uh, feeling deep down inside that his parents haven't prepared him well enough for the adult world or that they haven't really given him the advice that he needs to live a successful life. Um, but again, this is a mention of, of the title, which is something that you and I will discuss at length by the end of the novel. It's, a, it's the beautiful conclusion, really, of what The Catcher in the Rye is about. But remember this moment when it's first brought, brought up. Um, now, from that moment, Holden uh, decides yet again to not call Jane Gallagher, and we discussed in the last, last lecture why. Uh, but at this moment is one of the first times that Holden's going to have an encounter with a lot of young kids, right? So start paying attention to that. Once again, not just the Peter Pan complex, this desire to want to remain a child, but Holden as this longing, this idealization, this rom uh, romanticizing what childhood and innocence is like. You're going to see that Holden very much enjoys the presence of children, the company of kids, Right? Um, and he goes to the park and he sees these kids skating. And he desperately wants to be a part of their world. But he starts talking to them. But, you know, stranger danger, uh, like many of your parents have taught uh, us, our parents have taught us. And, you know, as much as Holden desperately wants to be a part of their world, pay attention. His interaction with kids are all very awkward because they don't recognize him as one of their own anymore. You know, he's this tall stranger to them. Um, and kids are very welcoming with other children, but one thing that they're very well aware of, or sometimes they're, they're, um, they can be distant from is when they don't recognize, especially someone who's an adult, right? So as much as Holden wants to be a part of their world, he's obviously graduated. His height alone no longer allows him to be part of this kid club, so to speak, in many ways, right? But here's where he mentions the museum, and many of you guessed this right in the last discussion question. 
Uh, the museum is the complete opposite of the symbols of taxis, cabs, hotels, trains, train stations. If those things represent transience and things that are not permanent, that are in a constant state of change, museums represent the opposite. Museums represent permanence, right? These are things that are protected behind glass. Uh, these are things that stay the same. Uh, if you ever gone to the Museum of Natural History, which is the museum that Holden speaks about here, nothing's really changed there in the last 50 years. And this is something that Holden loves, the notion of wanting things to stay exactly the same. Do you remember what he wrote his essay um, to Mr. Spencer about? Uh, he, had, he could write about anything, but he chose to write about mummification, the act of preserving something, the act of wanting to keep things exactly the same, right? And this is what happens here at the museum. This is what Holden loves about the museum is that the only thing that changes is you. The museum stays the same, right? That you can go back to a place uh, and everything is exactly the way you left it. Uh, the Museum of Natural History is kind of an interesting museum because it's really a taxidermy museum. Taxidermy is when you stuff animals, right? Um, and you kind of preserve them in place. Uh, it's not like going to a zoo or seeing animals interact with each other. Um, and things kind of, you know, you can't pose them differently. All the exhibits are pretty much the same there. And Holden uh, writes this, right? When he says, The best thing, though, in that museum was that everything always stayed right where it was. Nobody move. You could go there a hundred thousand times and that Eskimo would still be just finished catching those two fish. The birds would still be on their way south. The deers would still be drinking out of the water hole. And that squaw, that Indian woman with the naked bosom would still be weaving that same blanket. Nobody would be different. The only thing that would be different would be you. Ironically, look what he mentions, that birds fly south. He mentions a Native American blanket, which is what he brings up with Mr. Spencer early on. One of the things you're going to start to see about the catcher in the rye is that everything's going to start to get connected towards the end. It's a wonderfully fabricated novel. Um, and one of the things that he also mentions uh, about the museum experience, which has a deep connection in many ways to Lord of the Flies, is the notion of consequences. You know, he says when you were on a school trip, everything is easy. You're made to hold hands. You walk through the trip, and if you touch something in a museum when you're a kid and you're not supposed to, what happens? What are the consequences? Nothing, right? One of the things I think that we lose as we're kids, uh, or I'm sorry, one of the things we lose when we're children growing up, right, that we don't really realize is the notion of consequences, right? When you're a young kid and you do something bad, you might get a dirty look, you might get scolded by your parents, and then the next day everything goes back to being normal. Right. Um, a lot of you, for example, are, your, your teachers stress out about we talked about the statewide exams and ELA exams and all that. When you're a kid, what consequence did it really have for you guys now? Right. When you're a child, consequences for bad behavior are much less. One of the things that Holden despises about adulthood, right, is that as you get older, the consequences for things gets greater. Uh, remember Roger throwing stones in Lord of the Flies? That one of the things that keeps society intact is the notion of punishment, of consequences, right? And that's something that Holden understands that as you get older, the consequences for things are much dire. They're much more serious, right? If you, if you fail first or second grade, you know, you might still grow up to have a very successful life. Uh, but as you get older, you know, what happens if you fail at high school? What happens if you fail at college? What happens if you fail at your job, at a marriage, right? The consequences for things become much greater. Um, and I think this is why the museum becomes such an important and important and important uh, symbol, not only when just in understanding Holden, but also the Peter Pan complex. Look what he says here. I took my old hunting hat out of my pocket while I walked and put it on. I knew I wouldn't meet anybody that knew me and it was pretty damp out. I kept walking and walking. I kept thinking about old Phoebe going to that museum on Saturdays the way I used to. You know, as further proof that Holden's very much hung up on age, have you noticed what he calls everybody? He uses a very interesting adjective. He calls everybody old. Old Phoebe, old Stradlater, old Spencer, old Jane, right? This is a boy who's very much fixated on age. I thought how she sees the same stuff I used to see and how she'd be different every time she saw it. It didn't exactly depress me to think about it, but it didn't make me feel happy as hell either. Certain things, they should stay 
the way they are. You ought to be able to stick them in one of those big glass cases and just leave them alone. I know that's impossible, but it's too bad anyway. Anyway, I kept thinking about all that. All the while, I walked. And look at Holden, right? You can argue that this is the Peter Pan and the Protector Complex all kind of meshed into one, right? That Holden wants very much not to grow up. He's very much suffering from the Peter Pan Complex. But he also sees things around him like his sister that are innocent and pure. And he wishes to protect their purity, right? He doesn't call Jane like we discussed because he wishes in his mind to preserve that perfect image that he has of her. Right. You know, uh, once again, literature's ability to kind of reflect on our own human experience uh, class. A lot of you have already kind of experienced this before. Right. Where you go back to a place. Let's say some of you have traveled uh, summer times to go visit grandma or family in other countries. And, you know, you have this wonderful memory of it when you're a child and then you go back three or four or five years later. And those memories kind of come crashing down in many ways. Right. The things that you romanticized you were nostalgic about in your mind as being beautiful and awesome and this and that, uh, when you get there, the reality sometimes can be a little bit different. And that's kind of sad, you know, the notion that things change, that things um, aren't, they don't stay as perfect as we want them to. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is quite a long lecture for 40 minutes, but these questions that I provided, once again, they're not due until Monday, all right? Um, so take your time with them, listen to the lecture at your leisure, and I hope everyone is safe and sound and healthy. I miss you guys every day, believe it or not. Sounds corny to say, um, but nothing really substitutes coming into the class and seeing your faces and uh, calling you mofos and having a good time like we always do, all right? Hopefully you guys are reading, you're staying active, you're absorbing and you're kind of taking this remote learning for, or you're using this remote learning uh, as well as you can, all right? Good luck.